we missed a part of that. Uh, oh, let me just uh, share my screen first. And, uh, that, that's, that's not an introduction. Yeah. <laughs> just a brief introduction for this. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Okay. Uh, today is a <clears throat> it's, it's been a strange day because of certain medical issues that my wife had, and uh, <clears throat> I visit the uh, medical facility most of the mornings. I just got here some time ago, and I've uh, pulled up. Um, and I wanted to edit these slides a little bit, uh, but wasn't able to do so. So unfortunately, what I'll do, I still have a full talk for you. So we'll go through this uh, slide deck. It's Slightly older, but you know, I think um, it will still serve the purpose uh, and do justice to this topic of uh, frugal paper devices for decentralized medical diagnostic testing and specimen transportation. Um, Mega, is my screen visible? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, okay, great. <clears throat> so I'll just go ahead. Um, and uh, this talk was made uh, right around the time when COVID. Uh, was around the corner, but to make such a big impact on our lives. Uh, while my lab was still pretty much busily working on tuberculosis. Um, <clears throat> and then of course the whole lockdown happened and uh, we started asking the question of how these tools could be used for COVID-19. And uh, for the large, large part, last six months, mostly our work is focused on, on the is essentially the same technology that I developed for COVID-19. So um, what I to do now is basically just, um, uh, you know, uh, give you an introduction, background of this field, and then we'll see how this goes. Give me one second, I'm just gonna have a <clears throat> drink of water. <clears throat> um, so it's been a rough day. Um, is it okay if I stop sharing my video and, and I just speak, uh, if that's fine? Um, video in the sense if I stop showing myself. Yes, yes, sir. no problem. Okay. Um, although I'm not quite sure how to do it right now, but that's it. We'll just go. All right. <clears throat> Let me just focus now. All right. So, um, so I'll, I'll quickly start with an introduction of uh, tuberculosis. Uh, tuberculosis, of course, is an infectious disease caused by a bacterium, <clears throat> a bacterium called Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which primarily infects the lungs, uh, which is called pulmonary TB when it infects the lungs. It's a highly contagious disease uh, by airborne route. And it may stay dormant uh, for many, many years. And that's one of the major issues with TB uh, before onset of infection. Now, just always juxtapose this with COVID, right? Quite a similar thing. It infects your lungs, but the time scale of COVID is completely different. It's, uh, there's no such thing as a dormant COVID. It will either infect you or the immune system will just take care of it. And um, <clears throat> it can, you know, the progression of the infection is much, much faster uh, compared to TB is why the strategy of pandemic TB has never got as much attention um, as COVID because COVID infected, um, you know, infects people much, much faster and therefore it also spread, um, you know, around the world much, much faster than, than TB did. So, of course, some statistics from um, about 1.6 million deaths per those deaths uh, are in India. So, India, you know, uh, is a, has this weird trifecta of tuberculosis, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, and TB, HIV co-infection. Okay, kills one Indian every 90 seconds. Now these numbers, again, this presentation was made about a year ago. These stats were put about a year ago. Um, as much as COVID affects life, some of these numbers we still overtake the numbers for COVID. And and hopefully, once we take care of the COVID situation, uh, it it brings forth. Um, the intensity of the TB that the world has been facing for 100 years, gotten the condition it deserves. Um, just now, are beginning to report more um, TB. So, if detected early, TB is treatable. Okay, and that is one of the main um, golden uh, silver lining on the dark cloud here that we can actually treat TB. Right. So, the bottleneck in many cases is can we diagnose it early? Um, so how do we diagnose pulmonary TB right now? You know, a person typically comes in uh, with persistent cough and chest pain, fatigue, and weight loss. Again, if you have, you know, in COVID days, you'll only be reporting persistent cough. You wouldn't have had enough time to have the fatigue and weight loss. But TB is something that you don't really know. And you, you might have just some kind of a cough and you think that, okay, it's just something that will go away. And it doesn't usually go away and you have fatigue and weight loss. Then a patient reports and these are the typical symptoms. Chest x-rays typically will show a feature like this. Um, 
uh, where there is some kind of a, of a fluid um, uh, development in, in the X-ray. Um, and typically at that point, what is done is when the chest X-ray shows some abnormalities, uh, the sputum, which is basically is lung fluid, the patient is asked to cough, the lung fluid is collected in the tube, um, and that sputum is just put on a slide. This is called sputum smear microscopy. Um, and then you stain, um, you know, use a certain stain that colors a certain kind of bacteria. These are called acid fast bacteria. Um, and they instantly you get results and they show you that there's some mycobacterium tuberculosis is present and they get colored, but it's very poor sensitivity. Only about 50% of the cases are detected. And the other half, uh, when the uh, bacterial load is not very high, are actually missed. Um, <clears throat> other thing that is done is that the same sputum is taken and you can culture it. For, but the culture, the problem with NTB is that it takes a very, very long time to grow. Okay, so the fastest cultures known are liquid cultures will take minimum two weeks. Okay. Um, Solid cultures can take four to six weeks. And after that, that solid culture is used for drug susceptibility testing. So this culture can then be used to find out which antibiotic you're actually susceptible to, or if you're resistant to any of the antibiotics, and that takes another two to three weeks. So the traditional method, even though the gold standard culture tests are 100% accurate, they just take so long that you will often in, in countries like India and rural settings, you'll just uh, lose your patient, lose track of your patient uh, by that time. So, um, you know, not the ideal thing, it's still done, but you always need something much, much faster. And, and imagine the amount of infrastructure required for all of this, right? You just cannot scale it up um, really, really quickly. Um, so the world of <clears throat> diagnostics of TB sort of changed in the year 2010, when this company in the US called Sephir, they, they introduced this thing called as Gene Expert. So this Gene Expert MTB RIF test uh, was endorsed by the World Health Organization in 2010. This is um, uh, an instrument, a standalone instrument with a cartridge. And what is done is the sputum sample is put into the cartridge and multiple steps are automated. What all happens inside this cartridge is that once sputum is introduced, the bacteria is lysed. If, if there's bacteria, it's lysed using sonication or ultrasonic waves, uh, DNA is released. <clears throat> um, that sample undergoes some kind of a purification where the DNA uh, is separated from the junk. <clears throat> and this purified DNA then undergoes this process called PCR, which amplifies the DNA. Uh, this is the same thing that they use in RT-PCR for COVID. Uh, and then you detect it using some kind of a method. You can use uh, specifically what is done in this instrument is that a fluorescent dye goes and tags a certain part of the DNA and shows up in real time. Okay. All of this is automated. Uh, not only does it do it in an automated fashion, it also has probes that will tell you whether there are point mutations at certain locations within this DNA. Okay. And these point mutations are associated with drug resistance. And so uh, all of this, you know, in a, in a matter of two hours, you can collect the sample, tell whether the person has TB and whether that person is resistant to a certain drug. So this has become, you know, this really changed the landscape of TB diagnostics. Uh, <clears throat> and there has been a very rapid, not a rapid, there has been large scale rollout in India since then. Uh, but still this instrument at, in its, at its most subsidized rate costs around 18 lakhs. Okay. So this test for TB is still not like a household test. Um, and all of this I'm seeing actually has a parallel in, in COVID. But what happened in COVID is that all of the government resources were diverted towards COVID and we were able to somehow scale up um, our TPCR test. So I'll come to those points uh, in a bit in, in some time. Um, so yes, yeah, transform. Um, even before 2010, there was this assay called line probe assay um, by, by a company called Genotype that was already endorsed by the World, World Health Organization in 2007 -8. Um, Mega, am I audible? My internet uh, shows uh, some inst instabilities. Yes, sir, you're audible. Okay, okay. Um, so this is uh, maybe for the purpose of this, we'll skip the details. But again, it's a piece. What you have to do is you have to manually do PCR amplification, and then there is a paper-based strip on which many DNA probes are adhered, and the sample is flowed on on top of this paper strip. And then they, there's a certain kind of binding that occurs. And if there's a point mutation, this binding is not very efficient. So you can, you can uh, wash away the unbound DNA. And there are many, many lines on this strip. And they, these kind of lines tell you whether what kind of mutations exist. Uh, but the problem with this, again, is that it's highly manual. It involves many, many steps. Uh, so again, something that was not very um, scalable. But this is just to give you an idea of what uh, TB molecular diagnostics landscape was. 
So to put this uh, in context, um, the, given the fact that we, we primarily affected people from poor socioeconomic backgrounds, and that's still true, um, penetration of modern molecular diagnostic technologies into remote locations is still very limited. Even in COVID diagnostics, all the IPCR testing centers are largely restricted to cities. Um, so this gene expert and LPA assays that are just told to, you need expensive instruments and constant power supplies. Again, in a location like this in India, where TB might be rampant, uh, we just don't have these kind of facilities. Um, and LPF, of course, even requires well-trained technicians. So in 2014, uh, the World Health Organization, they published this high priority target product profiles um, for new tuberculosis diagnostics report. They said, what do we need to do in TB diagnostics? Okay, this is 2014 now. Um, they had several recommendations. And um, the, the landscape is largely still the same. We're still trying to find solutions to some of these uh, problems. So um, one of the things they came up is they said that we need a rapid sputum-based test for detecting TB at the microscopy center level of healthcare. So what the microscopy center? These are the very peripheral things um, where people can do these sputum smear microscopy, where they just have a small microscope, nothing else. Can we do rapid sputum based testing there? So that's a big requirement. We want to do next generation drug susceptibility testing at these microscopy centers. So we want to know whether mutations exist uh, at the point where microscopy centers uh, are there, right? Um, and then we also need a rapid biomarker based non sputum based test. This is because acquisition of sputum still happens to be quite a difficult um, kind of a problem. So when I started my lab in 2016 at IASC, um, <clears throat> So these were the kind of problems we tried to tackle. And of course, the tool we had in, in hand was paper-based microfluidics. So um, I'll be coming to that. But there's a need for providing diagnostic central lab in remote and resource-limited settings. Now, again, we can put this in the context of COVID, right? There's a need for providing RT-PCR kind of COVID testing, uh, not uh, in a centralized RT-PCR lab, but in your neighborhood lab, right? Um, if I just walk down and I have a small lab, and I just give a sample there, and can they do my COVID test? Um, why not? How do we enable that? What are the technologies for that? So those are the kind of problems that we try to tackle uh, in our lab. Um, <clears throat> hold on a second. I'm just going to keep an eye on my uh, clock, so I ensure that we have at least a minute. Okay. So what are the strategies for medical diagnostics for low resource settings? Um, so typically, you know, uh, so first of all, we don't have the state of the art analytical instrument here, right? So one strategy is that we can miniaturize this, use clever engineering to miniaturize this diagnostic device. So I can actually take it to the point of care. This is called point of care diagnostics. And the engineering challenges here are, can I make a sensitive and specific test and have it robust and reproducible and affordable? On the other side, the thing is, can I collect this specimen over here and I can I transport it to a point where a state of the art analytical instrument exists uh, but now I have to worry about effective stabilization of my sample. I have to uh, worry about compatibility of my sample with downstream analysis methods. Uh, I have to worry about optimizing transportation networks. And again, though this is completely outside my domain of work, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation actually has a big program in how you can optimize transportation networks, how you can use the, the Swiggies and Amazons and use their networks to transport samples. It's a very interesting proposition. There's a lot that can be done in global health that doesn't necessarily require very complex science, but just logistics and so on and so forth. So these are the gen these are generally the two strategies, and my lab works on both of these strategies, and I'll touch upon both of these areas too. Okay, so let's define the engineering problem now. So let's take the case of point of care molecular diagnostic test. Okay, if I want to do a DNA based uh, or a nucleic acid amplification test or a RNA based, like a COVID test. What I have to do, and this is true for COVID, I have to lyse the DNA or virus, release the DNA or RNA. Uh, I have to do what is called as nucleic acid extraction, which purifies my DNA or RNA. We have to amplify this, which is typically done by PCR, and then we have to detect it, <clears throat> right? So there are multiple steps involved in the nucleic acid amplification test. Similarly, if I'm doing an immunoassay based, a ELISA test, this is what is for your COVID antigen and antibody testing. Okay, not the rapid ones, but the ones that where the serum is collected and sent to the lab. Uh, this is where the antigen attaches to a solid plate. You come up with an antibody. You label it with a secondary antibody that is packed to an enzyme. And then you bring a substrate that will change color when it's exposed to the enzyme. Okay. All of these, as you can see, are multi-step reactions uh, that need to be done in order to get your result. 
so sensitive state of the art medical diagnostic testing is often pipetting intensive or it's it's it involves multiple steps and that's almost always true so unless you come with some kind of an automation these things are very hard to do in the absence of skilled labor so a good portable fluid handling platform is critical for developing the next generation point of care okay so this is where we are uh, we're moving into the realm of microfluidics now so um, skip some of this history of microfluidics perhaps uh, or maybe i'll just say that microfluidics really came into popularity um, starting from 1998 when professor george white said at howard university introduced this idea of rapid prototyping in pdms and now relatively low resource labs uh, could design channels or could draw channels on a computer and have them reproduced uh, in in a pdms device in a matter of, of a day or less than a day uh, and of course at uh, stanford university's professor stephen quay came up with the idea of walls in microfluidics uh, and since then this is 1998 2000 uh, the number of publications in this area has really skyrocketed uh, but the problem now that has come into picture is that even though the traditional microfluidic chip has been miniaturized um, the paraphernalia is just quite large the ancillary equipment required to flow fluids through the chip and control fluids on the chip uh, happen to be quite large and so the chip even in the safir gene expert you see that the cartridge is just a small part of the overall instrument and the instrument cost ultimately is still restricting you from making really low cost portable diagnostic devices so conventional positive pressure driven microfluidic devices require significant ancillary equipment so what do we do so there comes the idea of paper based microfluidics so these are platforms in which fluids are driven by capillary pressure generated by porous material and they completely eliminate pumps and this is the same uh, phenomenon by which water rises up a glass capillary because water would much rather be in contact with glass than than in contact with air because of surface tension um, and a very good example of that is a rapid um, this rapid home test or home pregnancy test which is a general uh, which is a generic example of a lateral flow assay where fluid can be introduced at one end uh, and it wicks from the left to right it's going to rehydrate some dried reagents those dried reagents are going to flow over some lines where some reagents are deposited and a certain chemistry is going to occur and if you have a certain antigen present in your body you'll get this line light up right some color change in occur so this is a lateral flow assay um and this is an example of a paper based microfluidic device in a sense because uh, you know it, it 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 involves fluid flow of fluid without pumps using porous materials <clears throat> now this is about 20 to 30 year old technology so this field was again sort of shaken up by george white sides in the year 2007 2008 when he introduced this idea of micropads or microfluidic paper analytical devices and the idea was that you could make a stamp sized paper microfluidic device by simply patterning some kind of patterns on this hydrophobic patterns on a piece of paper okay um so now for example anything that's not white is hydrophobic barrier i can introduce a small drop of fluid it's going to wick uh, and i can have reagents stored at these different locations that are going to change color uh, depending on what analyte is present uh, and this has really really caught popularity and people are now trying to think of this as a very very low cost um diagnostic device it appears great right what is the problem the problem is that both of these devices are still fairly restricted in what they can do for example here you can just do a one step chemistry fluid comes to this zone it's going to react <clears throat> it's going to have a color change but that's it you can do a a one step chemistry similarly here you have just one opportunity for the fluid to flow over this zone right if you want to do a multi step assay like an elise or a nucleic acid amplification test how do you do it these kind of paper microfluidic devices won't enable you to do that So uh, my postdoc advisor Paul Eager in the year 2011 uh, published this paper uh, where he came up with this idea of a two dimensional paper network okay so what you see is a credit card size device uh, and this device when it's uh, dipped into a limited volume fluid source uh, what happens is all three legs are dipped now fluid starts breaking up all these three legs there are dried reagents orange blue and red that start to get dehydrated and then they automatically uh, so if i'm sitting here i'm sitting here i see the yellow fluid go over me first then the blue fluid and then the red fluid right and in the end all of these will go and just water will come so what if i'm sitting here i will see yellow, uh, over a time of 30 minutes i will see yellow blue and red fluid pass over me, right so in a sense now uh, we have automated three different fluids flowing over a test zone and so if i want to do a, do a multi step assay i can now automate it using this kind of a paper microfluid device So later on during my postdoc, I invented these mechanical walls for paper microfluidics. So um, 
what these are is devices where these two paper channels are actually disconnected initially. They are mechanically disconnected. And, uh, and I have a, a certain actuator. In this case, it's a compressed sponge actuator. And when I make the actuating fluid channel red, the fluid is delivered to this actuator. The actuator expands and it causes connection between these two channels. And uh, it essentially makes the on switch. So here you will see fluid flows still here first. And after minutes of valve is automatically actuated and then it, it lets the fluid into the next channel. So there's a way by which the, the yellow fluid and the red fluid can be kept completely separate because there's a plastic barrier in between. And so you can have an actuating channel and a process channel. And you can control um, uh, the timing at which this valve goes on by simply controlling the length of this actuating channel. I can even divert fluid flow from going to the left to the right when the valve actuates now. So here, the fluid was initially flowing to the left, now it is flowing to the right. Uh, I could even have multiple valves in the same device. That's the first valve going off for 10 minutes, the next one will go off for 50 minutes. Uh, and all of this is completely power free. It's a one user step actuated device where you add fluid um, and then it will set off valves at, at predetermined times and you'll be able to do multi-step reactions. Here, for example, if I wanted a reaction A plus B giving C occur here, move the products here, uh, to this part of the strips, which is say, say at a different temperature to be the next reaction, and then move the product to this part of the strip, which is at yet another temperature, all of that can be done automatically using a paper-based device. Um, these uh, I, I came eventually to call automatic paper machine. This is something that my lab <clears throat> um, continues to develop uh, new and new devices. Based. Uh, so just to continue the timeline in 2000, uh, this is 1998 when George Whiteside talked about the first microfluidic a uh, PDMS-based device. Uh, he talked about micropads in 2007. Uh, 2010, Yeager Group came up with 2D PNs. 2013 onwards, several new valving mechanisms started, um, you know, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is where I got involved in the field. Uh, so about eight years now, uh, and this is from a review paper I wrote a few years ago on how uh, the field of microfluidics has done that. All right, um, so uh, coming back to track now, so based on all of these paper-based microfluidic developments, uh, in 16, I was part of a large team at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, there, were, there was a five-year project funded by DARPA, which is a part of the Defense Science Organization. DARPA is Defense Advanced Research Program Agency. Uh, they, they fund very, very ambitious kind of projects um, uh, that are uh, useful to the defense agency in one way or the other. And we were able to develop a single-use palm-sized nucleic acid amplification test. So the idea was that the user would swab themselves. Um, they would open the device, the swab themselves, insert the swab in a hole in the device, and then close the swab again, and just wait 60 minutes, and then they can read, read the results. What happens in 60 minutes is all of the steps of lysis of the nucleic lysis of the virus or bacteria, release of DNA or RNA, amplification, and detection using lateral flow assays. So this is based on paper-based microfluidics. Um, we have replaced PCR by isothermal DNA amplification. Uh, where we don't require PCR anymore, but we can do a constant temperature amplification. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more uh, uh, after a few slides. And this whole device is powered by just two AA batteries. There's a microprocessor chip on board for timing various operations uh, <clears throat> and all the processor mm -hmm. activation. And we did this initially for a, a, a methicillin resistant staph or is bacteria. Uh, I'll skip some of these internals because this is all work done as part of my postdoc and try to focus mostly on work we do here in IASC. So um, this is sort of gives you the background of the field and you know what work I did as, as a postdoc. And then I took a long flight from Seattle to Bangalore when I sat in my own lab at IASC. Um, and again, we won't have time to go over all of these things, but what I'll try to do now is give you snapshots of some of the areas we work in. Um, we developed this device called FlipNAP. Um, which is a portable paper-based nucleic acid amplification device. Um, I'll give you a brief idea of PM ELISA, which is a portable device to do ELISA, uh, and also Spectra Tube. This is, this is our Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funded project, um, where we have been able to develop a large volume clinical sample stabilization device. Uh, actually, that's all I will cover. I will not go into the fluid flow modeling aspect because it's more mathematical, and probably I'd like to spend much more time just chatting with you all and, and hearing your questions. So let's start with this first technology flip map. Now, this, as I said, was uh, in the context of tuberculosis diagnostics, uh, something that we've been interested in, uh, where we want to do tuberculosis diagnostics from sputum, this, this, um, this fluid that is coughed uh, up from the lungs, and we want to find out whether microbacterium tuberculosis uh, bacteria exist in there. 
So what we did was we put these uh, existing technologies on, on this kind of a, <clears throat> of a matrix, if you would, of cost versus ease of use um, or, or cost versus level of integration, which is inversely proportional to ease of use. So I'll, I'll tell you what that means. So the gene expert is very, it's quite expensive. At the same time, it's fully integrated, so it's very easy to use, right? On the other hand, there, there are very, very low cost devices um, that are not integrated at all. And so it requires you know, many, many user steps and therefore the use of, ease of use is less. So what we realize is that there is room for innovation here where can we build low cost devices that are still fully integrated and then we can use all of, all of our paper microfluidic um, uh, evolving technologies and integration technologies to develop devices that sort of fill this gap. So that's what we set out to. Um, and I'm sure it's a long path. We haven't reached there yet, but I'll tell you about some of the initial innovations we have made in that area. And of course, I love pictures of my students along the way who have done all of this work. So Navjot, my PhD student who's now submitted a thesis, developed this device called FlipMat. Um, this is the name we have given it. It stands for fluorescent isothermal paper and plastic mat. Mat is a nucleic acid amplification test. Um, it is a uh, modular device and a, a three module device is about the size of a glass slide, fits on the top of your hand. Each module has four circular paper discs. So this device contains 12 circular paper test zones, four tests per module. And what we do in these devices is, is an assay called loop mediated isothermal amplification. Uh, this actually amplifies your DNA at a constant temperature of around 63 degrees Celsius. And you don't require PCR. PCR requires thermal cycling of going, shuttling the temperature back and forth. But you can still amplify DNA without PCR by using something called as LAMP or there are other technologies also. And all these LAMP reagents are dry stored in these paper bags. Okay? And this is just the layer by layer assembly of this device. It's a, it's a paper and plastic device. Uh, and the user experience is so you add, um, you have to extract DNA from, from, your, from your sputum and you add your purified DNA in these devices and uh, you, you seal it and you just put it in an incubator which is set to 60 to 80 degrees, uh, which is set to 63 degrees Celsius for 60 to 80 minutes. Um, after that, you remove, you open the top seal, you add a certain fluorescent dye, you close the cover and you flip it. And at this point, uh, you can do uh, low cost fluorescence imaging using just a UV torch on the cell phone. Uh, is there a question? Okay. Um, so you can do this low cost fluorescence imaging using just a UV torch and a cell phone. And in theory, in the absence of DNA, PBDNA, you'll not see any signal and you'll see a, an increasing bright green signal as more and more PBDNA is present. Uh, so this is the LAMP assay, we adopted it from uh, a particular um, publication that existed from 2012 and it, we found that uh, the paper uh, the paper said that the assay was very specific towards the MPB comp and we were able to detect um, as low as 10 or 100 copies of the PB DNA. Actually, we can do better. Uh, let me just skip some of these details for the purpose of this talk. Um, I'll just go to the device. So this is how the device actually works. So fresh reactions were set up and reagents are added into the FlipNAT device. So in the absence, N stands for absence of PBDNA. You see, this is the color that was developed. Uh, one stands for 10 to the one, two stands for 10 to the two, and three stands for 10 to the three copies. And you see an increasingly green fluorescent signal as the amount of PBDNA increases. Um, and that is shown um, as a bar graph, including statistics over here. And so we came up with a, with a threshold intensity where we said that any device that has a signal intensity of mean of the negative plus three times the standard deviation is deemed as a positive. Um, so let me skip that. And then we actually did some clinical validation, collaboration CNC well load, where in the hospital, the sputum sample is connect, uh, collected and DNA was extracted there. Uh, the samples are then brought to IIC Bangalore where we did FlipMAT testing. Uh, so here, for example, in module one, in each module, we can do one negative control, one positive control, so that's N and P, and two replicates of, this is two replicates of sample one, two replicates of sample two, and two replicates of sample three. So you can see that the positive samples appear green, negative samples don't appear green, and again, the positive sample appears green. Um, and again, I'll skip some of these details, but after all the validation was done, we were able to, using 30 samples, show that FlipMat had a sensitivity of 100%, uh, which means that everyone that was uh, TB positive, through TB positive was in fact shown positive by our portable paper-based device. Um, the specificity was around 75%, however, uh, <clears throat> uh, which, which means that uh, some of the people who are not positive for TB were also shown to be positive. Um, so we are working on improving its specificity. 
but still this is a strategy that allows you to do this nucleic acid amplification testing in a very very portable device and you don't require any instrument uh, uh, a very very high amount for doing nucleic acid amplification just to summarize we have made a minimalistic and easy to use device for conducting mats or nucleic acid amplification tests the material cost of fabricating one device is under rupees 100 and the reagent cost per reaction is something like 50 rupees uh, so this very much addresses a one of the target product profiles uh, uh, which the who had uh, had sort of said that was needed which is a rapid sputum based test for detecting pb at the microscopy center level so recently uh, <clears throat> this paper of course uh, this work of course is published in scientific reports which is a nature family journal um, and recently we were contacted by some funding agencies within india actually um, the uh, the tata or the india health fund uh, requesting us if we would like to work together to take this ahead so you know we are in the talks currently to do that and uh, this work was also featured in a do it do it yourself science article uh, that was published by uh, one of the science family uh, journals so it has garnered quite a lot of attention in being able to do portable nucleic acid amplification um this is a brief overview of a few technologies so i want to our paper based elisa technology which i won't be talking much about but this is an automatic paper machine for detect uh, we are working on it in the in the context detection of a urine pb biomarker um and um, there is a particular biomarker pb called as lipoarabinomamin okay uh, it's around an 18 kilodalton glycolipid um it is detectable in the urine of patients having active pb infection but the the level is usually quite low and what is this antigen so if this is the cell wall of the mycobacterium tuberculosis um the slam actually is this large thing uh, is it's it's a all the way this branched portion why thing all the way going till here this whole thing is a large slam molecule okay so this has this can be detected if you have active pb this can be shared through your urine and you can actually that um So uh, the problem is that currently existing technologies just don't have sensitivity uh, such as that is home emergency test traditional on the strip um, and you can you'll get a cut change of lam exists that will talk about an active dv infection uh, but the sensitivity is the best known sensitivity is something like 66.7% and this is found in patients who have very very low loads of uh, of cd4 or these are highly hiv infected patients who have very low cd4 cell counts uh, in patients where they have normal immunity levels the sensitivity is very very low but there is proof that if you can enhance the sensitivity of your paper based diagnostic test itself then you may actually be able to use this to detect pb in in, uh, in non hiv infected pb patients so again i'll skip some of these details and uh, this is just to give you proof of proof of the fact that um, the earlier determined pb lam has a sensitivity of 1000 picogram per ml so it misses most of these patients most of whom have a picogram per ml level of lam much much lower than that so even if we can do a 10 10x improvement in the limit of detection we'll be able to get much we'll be able to cover many many more patients and we'll be able to use it as a very very simple tb diagnostic test so how do we do this so we are hoping to uh, to deploy our uh, automatic paper microfluidic or automatic paper machine technology for this so the idea here is that this is an automatic paper machine where if let's say if i'm going to add fluid over here is going to wick in the strip and then this yellow and the colorless and green um, reagents are dry stored here and what's going to happen is once i add red fluid in this and water in a reservoir over here a lot of things are going to happen automatically these three reagents will get rehydrated and they will automatically be delivered one after another so that's the red fluid that was at fresh we had it the yellow is being delivered and now the ye- the, the colorless is being delivered and then the green will be delivered right so <clears throat> so again if i'm sitting over here i am seeing red go over me and then yellow um, and then the colorless and then the green right all of this is happening automatic automatically in a matter of 20 minutes what can i do with this uh, i can do a signal enhanced immunoassay so for example a normal pregnancy strip or a normal immu- immunoassay will get me till this golden spot if i'm trying to detect this antigen i'll have two antibodies and the top antibody will be attached to a golden nanoparticle and i'll get a red signal but if i am able to wash the surface and put some kind of an enhancement reagent it will darken the signal but you need 
see multiple steps for that. So we automate that entire process in this device. So here you will see that this is the dry device. This is when the antigen is introduced. This is the original signal that you get in the absence of any kind of <clears throat> signal enhancement. But you can wash that device and you can enhance. See the signal to noise ratio goes from that to that. So you can actually enhance the signal and therefore the sensitivity of your device by using this kind of a, um, automatic paper machine. So device may be used for conducting uh, something like an ELISA, which is an enzyme uh, mediated signal amplification. So we have partnered with the Switzerland based um, foundation called uh, FIND, a foundation for innovative new diagnostics. So they are providing a state of the art antibodies against LAM. And this is still a project in progress. It's been very slow because of the international collaboration and FIND being the only um, <clears throat> foundation in the world that has access to these uh, high affinity antibodies. And then of course the COVID pandemic has just uh, affected the TB research in a big, big way. But uh, hopefully this gives you an overview of the kind of work that we are doing. So what is the target product profile we are targeting? Uh, we are trying to get a rapid biomarker-based, non-sputum-based test for detecting TB. Uh, and the proposed workflow is that you take urine, you add three drops, uh, you know, the same lateral flow strategy now that we use for detecting pregnancy, we would love for it to be used for detecting TB. However, the device wouldn't look like this. It would be more of a paper machine. Uh, so again, this is a platform technology that can be used to increase the sensitivity, sensitivity of any lateral flow assay. And the application is not restricted to infectious disease. Okay, I'll try to speak till 2.45, so about six more minutes, and then I'll open it up for questions. So last technology I'd like to highlight is our, um, this project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we call the Spectra Tube. This is a large volume clinical sample stabilization device. So let's look at the uh, sample stabilization of the specimen transportation problem. Okay. So what our aim is that we want to be able to move sample from this remote location, this village in India, maybe it'd be blood or sputum. And I wanted to, um, I want to take it to some city or a town nearby that has this affiliate gene expert, right? But the problem is that this process in India might often take a day or two, and the temperature might often be 40 degrees plus. So under this, such circumstances, the sample very easily just gets uh, destroyed. So one of the known technologies for, uh, <clears throat> for sample stabilization is this dry blood spot card. The drop of blood can be taken, introduced on a piece of paper where it can just get dried. Um, and the advantage is that it's simple and robust. It can be nailed anywhere, and there are several commercial sources. But at the same time, it's not suitable for higher volume, right? If I want to take sputum where I often need like one to two ml of sample, um, this technology fails, right? The other problem is that you have to air dry your blood sample. And imagine a TB infected sputum sample left drying in the air, it just causes cause of concern. Um, in the end, when this blood spot goes to a lab, they have to punch a small piece from this card and do PCR on that, right? So punching again, the, you have to handle the sample and that increases the risk of transmission at that point. So there is no established workflow or solution for dry preservation of sputum samples, but in general, uh, for dry preservation of large volume samples. Even in the case of COVID, what they do is that they just put the sample in a, in a viral transportation medium, which keeps it stable for a day or two. Uh, and in the context of COVID, it's okay because all of these tests are done fairly rapidly. But when you go to a very remote location, the VTM also is not the best solution. And the VTM, of course, um, has its own complications in terms of doing the PCR, but that's a different story for a different day. So we started looking into the problem of how do we stabilize large specimen volumes in paper? So we looked at these proprietary or uh, these uh, commercially available GE Watman FTA cards. What they have is basically these paper zones with proprietary mixture of reagents that lyse the blood cells and stabilize the DNA. Okay? Typically each zone can hold about 100 microliters of fluid. So we said, we want to do at least one of them, you know, more likely two or three. What happens if I simply make a large piece of paper with that chemistry and I add the fluid? Is that a problem? And the answer is yes, because there's a big mixing problem. As soon as I add a large volume of fluid on this piece of paper, the, the fluid rehydrates the reagents. As the fluid wicks, it just pushes the reagents away, right? And now all my stabilization reagents sit at the end and all my samples sit in the middle. And now there's barely any mixing, right? And so it was okay in a small zone like this. And even in that, it's a known problem that it's an inconsistent behavior, but because it's such a small zone, people really haven't talked about these issues. And our lab is just trying to bring some of these issues uh, to the focus. So we came up with an innovation here where we said that we can stack two paper layers having fairly different wicking properties. The top layer can be a glass fiber that has very low, um, that has a very high wicking rate, low resistance to flow. 
and the bottom layer is something like a filter paper containing the dried weed. And now the, the ensuing fluidics ensure that the fluid rapidly flows to the top layer um, and then uniformly rehydrate the bottom layer. And you can now very, very uniformly mix your liquid with the dried reagent of the body. And you can also make this much, much faster. So on the left hand, it takes 118 seconds to get through this high resistance membrane. And on the right side, we have gotten, gotten down to 20 seconds. So um, we have now the mixing problem in paper. And so I can have a large paper layer now, and I can have a dried reagents in it. I can add one ml of fluid and still have it very uniformly mix with my dried reagent, right? But the next question is, how do we avoid sample drying in open air? And also, how, we, how do we retrieve the dried sample? So now let's say the homogenized sputum is added on this device. On the top, it's going to spread on my, piece, on my device. I don't want to dry it in the open air. So we just designed this device such that it fits exactly snugly within the 50 ml centrifuge tube. Okay, So I can either add the fluid like this, or I can have the device vertically within the 50 ml centrifuge tube attached to a funnel. And once the fluid is added, if you look at the top view, this is where the cassette that will hold your one ml of fluid. And we have these side pockets where we have silica gel, which is a very, very, um, it is basically a dehydrant, right? It's going to absorb all the fluid away. So we found that 1.5 ml of 2x diluted sputum can be dried in six hours. Um, so for the user, you just add the fluid, close the lid, uh, the, the sample gets dried, it gets uniformly mixed with the dry, the stabilization agent, then it gets dried. And now you can reconstitute using something like any kind of a buffer and you simply centrifuge it out and you can recover the entire sample in the fluid state. So this overcomes many of the problems with the current blood spot cards where the sample is only retrieved as a small punch of paper. We can retrieve it as a liquid, we can retrieve the entire sample. We can rapidly dry store large volumes. We don't have to air dry, right? Um, so these are some details on which paper you must use for drying, but Long story short, we realized that glass fiber membrane, specifically standard 17 glass fiber membrane, is the best for releasing dried reagents from, uh, from, it, from it. So we started using this glass membrane. And this is some data that shows that um, DNA copy numbers at zero hours versus five days. So for over five days of dry storage, glass fiber membrane, we saw very little loss in DNA copy number after drying. Whereas with others, we saw more of a loss in copy. I'm just going through this a little bit fast because those are the details. So what we have come up with is this device called Spectra Tube. What we propose is that in a remote location, sputum may be collected. This can be a deep remote village in India. The sputum can be diluted. The sputum is like this thick fluid, right? It doesn't flow. But there's always something called as a sputum a homogenizing solution, which is like a very thin uh, like water. So you mix your sputum in the homogenization solution. It now becomes a clear liquid, which can be introduced into your device, close it, and that's it. In the next hour or two, the thing will dry. You can just put it on your truck. It can take up to five days, up to a week, no problem. It can reach your site uh, of analysis. You open the tube, add a buffer, close the lid, centrifuge it, and your sample is ready for your gene expert testing. So this is likely the first um, workflow for dry uh, transportation of, of sputum. Uh, so first device is designed for dry stabilization of sputum. Um, uh, when I say clinical trials, we are currently testing this new, again, Right at the beginning of the pandemic, we were trying to do this in collaboration with the hospital where we are taking real sputum samples, uh, trying to transport them, but again, we sort of put a big dick on all of our um, uh, sort of uh, momentum in this area. But we aim for these to be universal devices for all types of liquid specimens, right? We can dry store urine, saliva, large volumes of blood, why not? And there's something going ahead my lab would try to look into. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip the fluid flow modeling part, and we are at 246 now. Um, probably just move on to my um, concluding remarks, uh, just to say that technologies um, or the, uh, for the bottom of the pyramid are essential for tackling the tuberculosis epidemic, very much the COVID epidemic also. But COVID, you know, uh, TB, the problem was that it was always more concentrated in the very low resource settings of the world, whereas COVID actually affected the high resource. Uh, uh, settings first, and therefore TV requires a slightly different approach. Um, and paper-based devices can be used for applications that are well beyond simple colorimetric assay. So a lot of work in paper-based microfluidics is still very much focused on what George Whiteside originally proposed, which is these kind of colorimetric paper-based devices. But we've now shown that it can be used for nucleic acids, ELISA's, um, dry stabilization of sputum, and so on and so forth. And of course, my last point was more about um, 
the modeling part, which is how better physical understanding of flow and paper is bridging the gap between theory and application. But that's something I'm going to skip. Uh, this is my group um, a while ago. Some of these members have now left and some new ones have been. But I'll just leave my talk that. And you know, we have a hopefully about 12 minutes or so uh, for questions. All right. Thank you very much. Take it away, Mega. Hello. Any questions, students? Hello. Yes. Uh, no, sir. I'm just asking students if they want to have any query. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> Sir, thank you so much for the, uh, if I must say, very innovating, um, very inspiring uh, lecture, sir, because it was definitely an eye-opener to know that so many new technologies at the level of um, genetic testing themselves can be done on paper in contrast to what I, in contrast to the uh, th uh, thing that I had previously thought of. So it was very inspiring, sir. Uh, one question, sir, um, how... Uh, can we compare dry chemistry like dipstick methods with uh, these methods? Like what will be the advantage of microfluidics over dipsticks and why? Uh, because predominantly in our government setups currently, I think that is what we are using, sir, dipstick methods. So how do we get um, right. microfluids into this? Yeah, this is great. Yeah, right. So um, let me answer your question on two levels. First, uh, technology only needs to be as complicated uh, as as its application is, right? So as long as the dipstick is working, if it's working for what it needs to do, then actually there's no need to complicate the technology further, right? But you need to do something, you need to uh, sophisticate it further if, for example, the dipstick technology is not sensitive enough to detect something. For example, if it's used to detect a heavy metal in water, right? And if a simple dipstick is not doing its job, maybe you require a multi-step chemistry and a, and a multi-step chemistry exists to do something like that. Now is the time where you can actually design a, a paper microfluidic device where, you know, you can have a test zone and using some of the, the tricks that we showed you, you can flow fluids in a time sequence over a certain test zone, right? So that I can do a multi-step uh, uh, multi <clears throat> um, uh, detection chemistry. Now a dipstick, so that's one answer. Now it won't look like a dipstick, but the experience is when you have a dropper, you dip it into the water, you take that water and you just add it in the device, right? And then there might be walls going off on the device and you'll be able to do your multi-step assay, right? That's one answer. The last thing I would say is there are ways to even incorporate multi-level uh, or uh, uh, multiple multi-step fluid delivery, even in a dipstick, right? So, um, and there are some of these papers are out there. So I'll just use this. Uh, so if this is a, if this were your dipstick, right? So it would be much narrower or, or, or taller or something. There are ways to pattern flow channels within the dipstick so that if I dip this thing in a fluid, uh, right, uh, fluid will be wicked up at two or three different locations. And the first thing would go to a test zone faster. The second zone, because the length of the channel is just serpentine and made longer, it will appear later. And the third one is even serpentine and longer and it will appear later. Sorry. Um, sorry, anyways, so what I'm saying is that even, even a dipstick can be made more sophisticated to have uh, multi-step fluid delivery if needed. So hopefully that uh, answers your question. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Sudarshan and Balaji. Any other questions, sir? Any other questions? You can ask me here. Uh, any question on this topic uh, sir is it possible to uh, have a sm small motor in the uh, microfluidic device up. sorry a small what in the microfluidic device uh, still small motor that uh, creates flow at the motor. speed that we want uh, so that we can separate things 
not only on the basis of density but speed gradients uh so this could be done in a traditional microfluidic device so probably not in paper because of you know paper has very very small pores micron scale pores in traditional microfluidics uh you want to separate things there are many many different strategies for that so um, one thing is uh, if you want to do it on the basis of thank speed you, you can uh, flow just you can flow fluid into a a circular wow. kind of a channel full uh, zeric mass that fluid elements are different this fluid elements at different distances from the center would have a different you know they'll have the same angular velocity but they'll have different linear velocity and people have managed to separate things based on that so there are many many ways of separating thing in microfluidic channels and you can look them up motor probably is the, one of the harder ways because even microfluidic channels are of the order of tens of microns right or, or maybe 100 microns so a motor at that scale will probably make it more expensive and make your life harder Uh, but that's my best guess maybe you can invent something that will be better and sir in your uh, diagram sir of the nat uh, nucleic acid based uh, paper microfluidic uh, for the marsa carriage uh, sir there is a press button and uh, so sir uh, uh, why the, have you used electricity for some process right yeah yeah <clears throat> I, i can go back to that but uh, Yes, there are two AA batteries. What what are the batteries needed for? One, we need to lyse the MRSA. So the lysis occurs at a slightly high temperature. In fact, we heat the tube for ninety five degrees Celsius for uh, like I think sixty seconds. Uh, <clears throat> so that's where the batteries are required. So there's like it's a resistive heater. So the batteries uh, actually power that. That's one thing. The pushing actually occurs because there are buffers stored in the in two syringes, and when you push it. the fluids from the syringes are, are pushed and they enter two other tubes that have dried reagents in them one has the lysis reagent one is just a buffer uh, so that pushing actually actuates those two reagents and they rehydrate those that's one um, <clears throat> and the electricity is also there to time the valve so after 5 minutes of lysis a certain valve is actuated that releases the lysed bacteria into the paper and after amplification the amplified dna is released into the uh, nitrocellulose detection strips so all of these valves are also actuated uh, so even though i showed you paper based like the sponge based valves um later on when the, we have in at least one of the embodiments of the device just for simplicity we actually use an electronic electronically actuated valves so yeah hopefully that addresses your question okay so uh sir if sponge uh, if sponge based microfluidics uh, can be made uh, like uh, so sir can we also culture them like uh, the traditional microfluidics of, uh, for example let's say pancreas beta cell culture or the, is there a possibility in future that uh, good question so you're saying is paper based cell culture a possibility is that is that the question yes sir yes sir yeah that's a great question um, in fact um, Uh, again george white says in one of uh, one of his very interesting papers showed that you can culture uh, cancer cells uh, in certain kinds of paper but it wasn't pure paper what they did was they uh, took paper and then in each layer of paper they added uh, matrix gel matrix gel is this extracellular matrix that can be extracted from cancer cells and uh, by doing that and then they stacked these uh, paper layers each layer having matrix gel in it and then they were able to put cancer cells in them and then they stacked the paper and made a tissue and then they showed that uh, they could culture it for several days and that after several days they had nice concentration gradients of oxygen and what not developed in it okay so yeah now native paper is probably not very compatible with these cells but you can always coat the paper with certain kind of uh, uh, gels yeah. to make them compatible yeah okay so uh, that would be revolutionary if that happens like uh, the world would change just it's like actually it, well it uh, you know it's actually being done so just take a look at it uh, part of the problem with these paper based things is that they are not um, you cannot custom uh, so why is regular microfluidics so much in vogue for doing culture right because you can tune you can make whatever shape whatever 3d shape you want inside it right using pdms uh, and so you can make a lung cavity or something that looks like a lung cavity kidney what not and this continuous flow which is controlled by a pump so you can control the runnels number and what whereas in a paper microfluidic device the pore structure is largely predefined right there's not much you can do to it 
even the flow you can't control that much right because the flow is just under capillary pressure so i think there are some very good applications for paper based culture uh, and they've been around for at least 8 9 years now maybe they'll be revolutionary um, and write to me about your idea i'd be happy to see those or write me an email um, but but i think it's been around and and it hasn't really found the big killer app yet okay sir thanks sure. thank you sir okay so i have a question नहीं ऐसे नहीं हो सकता क्या है सिर्फ ओके सो स्टूडेंट्स आई कंसीडर दैट यू हैव मोर क्वेरीज एनीवन 